Welcome back to another episode of your favorite podcast, Deek to Deek. In this episode, I had a chance to sit down with 2021 ACC Head Football Coach of the Year, Dave Clawson. Coach Clawson and I talked about his coaching career, what it takes to wear the old gold and black, plus much, much more. Take a listen. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, go Deeks. So, Coach Clausen, uh, thanks for coming and uh, taking the time to be a part of uh, Deke to Deke. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, share with Deacon Nation what it was like growing up in Youngstown, New York in the 70s. <laughs> well, I, I was uh, born in, in Niagara Falls, New York, and we lived in a little uh, bedroom community, uh, Youngstown, which is right where the Niagara River empties into Lake Ontario. And it's a, a small town, 1,800 people. Uh, you know, apple orchards uh, right across the uh, Niagara River from Canada. And I was born there and lived there until I was in kindergarten. And then in 72, our family moved to a, a town called St. Mary's, Pennsylvania, which is in uh, Elk County, Pennsylvania, another real small town. And then we lived there from 72 to 1980. And then 1980, we moved back to Youngstown. Uh, so you know, we, we moved a little bit, uh, our family unit, I think whenever you're in a family that moves, your family unit gets closer, uh, but they were both great places to grow up. Uh, youth sports were very good. Uh, you know, these were places that you didn't have to lock the doors and uh, everybody kind of knew everybody. And it was, uh, you know, it was a very supportive environment uh, in both communities, sports were very important. And uh, I always felt like the, the schools were good. So we were very lucky. So, Coach, how did you get into athletics? Was it from uh, siblings or just being in areas where youth sports were very important and, and heavily emphasized? Well, I, I really got to say the main reason I got into athletics was my dad. Uh, my dad was, uh, you know, still to this day, my dad is the most competitive person I've ever met. And, uh, you know, he played uh, basketball and baseball growing up, um, and he ended up playing junior college basketball for a couple of years at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. And uh, I just grew up as a huge Pittsburgh Pirate, uh, Pittsburgh Steeler fan. My dad played in every recreational softball league, basketball league that he could do. Uh, that's what we did. We, we played sports in our free time. So I was in organized baseball from the time I was five or six years old. And after school every day, we used to go to the boys club in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. And it was nonstop, you know, basketball, football, baseball, boxing, dodgeball. I mean, it was just activities <laughs> nonstop. Uh, and I just, you know, became very competitive with it. And I developed a love of sports. And that went on through my high school days. I was always a, a three sport guy, football, basketball, baseball. And even in college, I was fortunate enough to play two sports. Well, coach, I was going to ask you about that uh, and, you know, playing two sports in college. But before I get to that, when did you know in high school that you could play college athletics, college sports, uh, let alone two sports? How did you know? Uh, that you could get that opportunity in one? Was it a game or was it just somewhere in your process of, of getting better? What was that sign, that signal for you? I mean, I don't know if there was a sign. I just loved it. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I tell this story all the time. My best friend from high school uh, is a guy by the name of Alan Ilya. And Alan Ilya uh, and his dad and my dad, we took uh, a trip our junior year in high school and we looked at I don't know 12 or 14 different colleges mm -hmm. and we fell in love with one particular school that we both wanted to go to and that was Wake Forest University and seriously uh, yeah I have was, never heard this story yeah wow. we fell we fell in love with Wake Forest and uh I wanted to play sports in college it was not as important Alan uh that he wanted to go to a great school that had a big time athletic program. So Alan applied to Wake Forest and went to Wake Forest. Um, and I sent Coach Dooley a film and uh, a video. And, you know, I, I got a, a nice polite note back that said basically, thanks, but no thanks. 
Um, so at that point, I didn't know if I could play college football. And then uh, the next school, my second favorite school on the trip was the University of Richmond. And I sent their coach the old VHS tape and I got the same thanks, but no thanks letter. And, and my recruitment really came, ended up being like Ivy League schools and division threes and Patriot League schools. And the division three gave me the opportunity to play two sports. And, and quite frankly, that was probably the level I belonged at. Those were the schools that recruited me most heavily. And, uh, you know, it worked out that I got a chance to play football and basketball in college. And, you know, if Coach Dooley had just showed a little love, who knows, Kevin, maybe we'd have been teammates. <laughs> Well, Coach, I was going to ask you, becoming head coach and taking the program to the level that it is, do you sometimes, do you still have that letter and just want to chuckle? Well, no, I, I he may, in terms of me as a player, he probably made the right decision. You know, when I, I coach our guys and I watch their strength and size and speed and movement skills, I'm like, Coach Dooley knew what he was doing by rejecting me. So there, there's there's no ego on that one, Kevin, for sure. So you went on to, to uh, Williams College, if I'm not mistaken, right? Correct. Now you play two sports, uh, basketball and football, correct? Uh, yes. Now, correct. would you advise or would you allow any of your players to participate in two sports? Yeah, I think at that level, you can do it. At this level, it's much harder. Yeah. Uh, and even at that level, it was a challenging because from the time you know, football camp started in August uh, until the end of basketball season in, in February or March. I mean, it was nonstop. I mean, you know, Christmas breaks and Thanksgiving breaks, we didn't have them and I didn't get either of them. And, and by the time basketball was over, you know, you were so tired and so exhausted. Uh, and, and that was at a division three level that the commitment wasn't nearly what we ask our guys here. And, and quite honestly, I had a lot more success with football than I did with basketball. You know, on football, I ended up becoming a three-year starter. And uh, in basketball, I was, you know, I was uh, always a second string guy and, you know, one of the, the last guys off the bench. Uh, but even that, I look back and I'm grateful for it. Uh, I, I think when you have both of those roles uh, in college, uh, certainly as a head coach, I appreciate the players here that are on the scout team mm -hmm. and the role that they have and how important it is because it's a role uh, in basketball in college. That, that was my role is to get the starters ready for the next game. So I think you look back at every uh, maybe disappointment or maybe thing didn't something didn't break the way you wanted it to. And, and there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm grateful for the experience I had at Williams playing two sports. Now, when did you know that coaching was going to be what you wanted to do? Is that something you've always known or uh, was it in the process of, of playing in college? What was that moment for you? It, it probably was around my junior year in college. Uh, we played a game and I went to block a punt. And that was when they allowed you to cut block on special teams. And I blew out my knee. And oh, it was wow. like the third or, or fourth game of the season. And you know, that was a year that I thought I had worked hard for and was having a good season. And it was just, uh, it was devastating, but I missed it so much. So I poured myself into the strategic part of it. And I ended up going to all the secondary meetings and all the linebacker meetings. And I, I really viewed it as an opportunity to learn the game better. And my head coach at the time was a guy named Dick Farley. And Coach Farley is in the College Football Hall of Fame, and he's still somebody I'm close with. We still talk, you know, once a month or every other month. Uh, but he would have me work with the younger secondary players. And I kind of decided, you know, coaching college football was something I'd like to try. Mm -hmm. And I got a job as a graduate assistant coach at the State University of New York at Albany in 1989. And, you know, 33, 34 years later, I'm still trying it. Well, Coach, in, in your 30-plus years of coaching, uh, what sort of stands out in your career for you the most in terms of a lesson that you've learned? So let's look at it this way. What is the biggest lesson you've learned in your coaching career? It, there's so many lessons, Kevin, but I, I would say that as time passes, 
uh, the things you value aren't how many tackles somebody made or how many touchdowns somebody threw for, uh, but it's the relationships and the friendships and the lifelong bonds that the sport of football builds. Mm -hmm. uh, even to this day, uh, you know, 30, whatever, three or 34 years later, you know, some of my very closest friends in the world are the people I played college football with. And as I see our players go through Wake Forest and Bowling Green and Richmond and Fordham, when I see those relationships continue 10, 20, 30 years later, uh, those are the things that, that stand the test of time. And so we obviously we're competitive and we want to win football games and we want to win championships and we want all conference players. But I think more than anything out of this experience, I want our players to live with a degree, leave with a degree and friendships that will last them a lifetime. Uh, and so when the freshmen come here, one of my day one meetings is right now, you don't know these guys, but if you do this thing right, you know, these are the guys that are going to be the best men in your wedding and uh, in your wedding and the godfather to your children. And you're going to vacation with their families in 20, 30 years. And that to me is the greatest value of college football is, is the relationships it builds. You're right about that, Coach. I was thinking about those guys that were in my wedding, and I was thinking about the uh, the first day on campus, and there's no way I would have thought that the first day, that none of these guys are going to end up in my wedding, but they're some of my greatest friends. How do you create that atmosphere at Wake Forest where uh, they do come together as family and build those bonds as well as play great football and have wonderful academics? But how do, what is your secret to curating that atmosphere and culture? I don't know if there's a secret. I think the, the way that you develop relationships is you invest in your friends, you invest time, uh, you invest emotional energy, uh, that when they're hurting, you're hurting and you truly celebrate their successes. And that's one of the things at Wake Forest that I find uh, the whole campus community here uh, makes those bonds, I don't want to say easier to form, but because of the size of the school and the location of our football facilities, our players have the opportunity to interact with us and interact with each other so much more often than at a typical Power Five school that, you know, the facilities are off campus by the stadium or they're at the edge of campus or the only time the players are in the building is during meetings or practice. Uh, because of our location, I think it's so easy for our players to come over here all the time. And that's one of many reasons why I love working here is we get so much more interaction uh, with our players uh, and we deal with so much more than other, you know, what play we're gonna call on first down or what blitz we're gonna run on third down. Uh, the nature of the school is very relationship oriented and we try to build our program the same way. And the way that Wake Forest is, I think, really helps us in that process. Coach, you talk about the location of the different facilities on campus. Talk, uh, spend some time talking about the Sutton Sports Performance Center, the McCurry Football Complex, the Doc Martin Practice Field. What do those things, those facilities, those upgrades mean for the program and sustain, sustaining success long term? There's so many benefits to having this, you know, the quality of our facilities on campus. Uh, you know, I think number one, people always say, well, geez, you need that for recruiting. And that's true. Uh, I always used to say when I first got to Wake Forest, you know, if you go to Farrell Hall and you look at our business school and you look how beautiful that building is and how the setup is like a campus living room that there's no question that Wake Forest is committed to great business education. And when we got here in 13 and 14, we did not have that facility commitment. And so it was really easy to tell people that football was important here. It was hard to show them that football was important. Um, and now that we have these beautiful facilities, uh, it, it certainly helps in recruiting. Uh, when recruits come here, 
uh, they're really blown away by what we have and what makes it even more convenient is where they're located. I think the other part of it, and I maybe didn't understand this before we built them, is because these facilities are so nice and they're so functional uh, that our football team has probably a little greater pride in what they do because they look at the commitment that's made and they now feel that what they do is important, that it matters uh, to the athletic department, it matters to the institution, it matters to our donors. Uh, I think there was much more of a greater sense of pride uh, in what they did because of the facility investment. So again, the impact of this is you can't understate it. It's helped us in recruiting. I think it's helped develop players. It's helped with their morale. And they do. They feel what they do is important here. And, you know, not that they didn't, didn't in the past, mm -hmm. but there was no really proof that it was important here. And, and now there is proof that, that football and athletics is, is very important on our campus. And coach, I've seen you use it in a functional uh, way, uh, especially during the spring when you started part of the uh, morning practice off outside on the field and then the rain came and it was such an easy transition to the indoor facility. So you didn't lose time sending guys in to change shoes and going into the gym and, and you could possibly lose anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes just making a transition. But with the new facilities, you were able to move inside and keep the pace of practice going. And when the recruits and others saw it, I mean, it was just a, a wonderful pace. And so I've seen the impact there and players coming in and having a space to work out on their own at their own time. And it's just been amazing to see it. And you've seen the results on the field. So coach, having said that, and you mentioned recruiting, using it for recruiting, I get this question a lot. What does it take to play football at Wake Forest for Dave Clawson? Well, we have been, uh, I think, very upfront in our recruiting process. And when we recruit a young man, you know, we feel that there's, there's three really, really important traits. Uh, you know, first of all, they have to have ability and love football. Uh, Wake Forest is a very, very competitive environment. Uh, in athletics and in the classroom. And if you don't love football here, if you don't want to be pushed, if you don't want to be developed, if you think you're a ready-made product and you don't have to work hard, this is not the environment for you. Uh, you know, we, we run a, a program of accountability and, and we challenge these guys. So we need guys that love football. Uh, secondly, we have to recruit players that not only have the academic ability to graduate from Wake, but those academics has to be, have to be important. There has to be a commitment that they are gonna go to class, uh, that they are gonna be part of the greater university community um, and dive into their fellow students in their academic courses and they wanna be challenged in the classroom. And then the third piece of that, Kevin, is it's really hard to be a Wake Forest student and especially a student athlete if you're not a high character person. Uh, the school is small. The classrooms are small. Everybody gets to know everybody. Uh, this is not a place that somebody of poor character can hide. Uh, the, the people with not, without good character, without good morals and values, they stick out like sore thumbs here, and it's just not a good place for them. So that's really been you know, our, our three prongs is love ball, go to class, and, you know, no issues, be a good person off the field, make good decisions. Coach, I want to go back a little bit and uh, talk about uh, your time at Bowling Green, uh, specifically when you're coming off a good season and you get the call from Ron Welming about the opportunity at Wake Forest. What made you ultimately say yes to coming to be the head coach at Wake? Well, I'm just, I'm glad Wake wanted me. <laughs> I was always going to say yes. I, I needed Ron Wellman and Mike Buddy to want me. Uh, you know, Ron called me, I think it was on a Wednesday. Uh, and it was the day that Jim Grobe decided to, to resign. And uh, he asked me if I'd be interested in the Wake Forest job. And I said, absolutely. Uh, that, this has always been a place for many reasons that I thought if I ever had the opportunity to be the head coach here, that would be a, a great honor and a great challenge. Uh, 
at the time at Bowling Green that week, we were playing Northern Illinois uh, for the MAC championship. And we had spent five years there and Bowling Green had not won the MAC championship since I think 91. And I told Ron that uh, I was very interested. I really wanted to talk to him, but I didn't think it was right or appropriate or fair to the people at Bowling Green to be having those discussions and interview while we were preparing for a championship game. And I, I just said, I, I hope this doesn't eliminate me from your list, uh, but we've worked really hard and we've asked our players to have a focus uh, and a purpose. And I, I don't think it'd be right if, if I violate that. And so I, I'd love to talk to you about the job. I would just, if you don't mind, I'd really like to be able to focus on this game and then I'd be happy to talk afterwards if you can wait. And Ron was great. He's like, I understand, we respect that. You know, go win a championship and we'll meet afterwards. And so we had that game on a, a Friday night. Uh, and then Ron and Mike Buddy came over to, to uh, our house in Bowling Green on Sunday. And we spent almost the whole day together and then a lot of Monday morning. And then they offered me the position and it didn't take too long to say yes. That's awesome, Coach. Was it uh, was the was it the uh, just the culture? Was it the uh, was there a particular thing that Ron just sold you on, or was it just your history of knowing what Wake Forest is and what it represents, and you just wanted to be a part of that? What was that draw for you? I think part of it was when I was the head coach at Richmond. Mm -hmm. To me, we had very similar challenges that Wake Forest had. You know, we were small, we were private, we were very academic, and what was predominantly uh, a state school land grant institution led. And there's certain challenges with that, but there's also certain advantages. And watching what Jim Grobe was able to do here from 06 to 08, I thought there was a formula to win at Wake Forest. And I thought a lot of the same principles that Jim used when he won, we were doing the same things at the University of Richmond. So I was very comfortable with what the challenges were and, and really felt that the size of the school and the academic uh, you know, prestige of Wake were not disadvantages, but in fact, the reason we could win, that we had something very special, unique and different to offer than most schools in the country. And again, because of that, I viewed all those things that a lot of people view as negatives as part of the, the biggest strengths of Wake Forest. And so we have not hid uh, from our size or the academic work that it takes to graduate from here, but we've championed that. We feel that is a, a, a difference maker for us. And for the right people and the right student athletes, uh, we, we feel this is as good of an environment as there is in the country to play college football. Is, is, is that what keeps you here, coach? Because sometimes what, uh, what attracts you uh, can shift in terms of what keeps you. Is this pretty much the same thing as, as what keeps you here? I mean, Kevin, I just, you know, I'm really happy here. My family's really happy. Our staff loves it. Uh, you know, I, I think in college athletics, you know, sometimes you just gotta, you gotta look at yourself and you gotta look at a place and do you fit? Does your value system align with the institutions and the departments? And uh, in, in the case of uh, our staff, and I just don't mean me, cause it's all of us, you know, we've had success here because of our entire staff and our players. I just believe philosophically we agree with the value system of Wake Forest University. And when you can find a place that you work, that you're in philosophical alignment, uh, that you're supported from the board, the president, the athletic director, why would you leave? You know, we're very happy here and, and you know, why leave happy? Yeah. Coach, when you showed up here on campus, your first day, what was the first thing you changed? Oh, I don't know if you change anything one day, I think, you try to assess, um, you know, what are the problems? Uh, you know, there had been five consecutive losing seasons after three incredible years. What happened? Why did it happen? 
instead of jumping in and making a bunch of quick decisions, you know, I tried to spend time with the coaches that were here. I tried to spend time with the players. Uh, I met with the student body leaders uh, and asked them their perception of football and the football program here. Uh, you dive into the recruiting right away. It's you try to recruit the best players you can as quick as you can to start building the roster. Uh, but more than anything, I wanted to, to learn about Wake Forest and make sure that before I made any decision that it was an educated decision that I wouldn't later regret. That's awesome. Uh, so you come in and uh, first couple of years or so were kind of tough. And then coach, you have just had the program on this steady trajectory going forward and continuing to get better. But you've done that everywhere you have gone. I mean, Fordham, Bowling Green, Richmond, you've just brought in this level of success. success. Where does that come from? Where, where does that making things uh, a little bit better than when you found them. What does that come from? I mean, I would say this, Kevin, uh, you know, my, I think my best skill as a head football coach is my ability to hire well. Uh, <laughs> I get way too much credit. You know, we have an incredible staff. We really do. I mean, you look at our offensive success yeah. and you know, we've had the same offensive coordinator, running back coach, receiver coach, and offensive line coach going on nine straight years. You know, the new guy on offense is Wayne Lindenberg, who does special teams, and he joined us in 17. Uh, you know, having Dave Cohen uh, on defense and recruiting Atlanta and Georgia for nine straight years. Uh, the, the staff is more than transactional. There's a lot of really long-term deep relationships on this staff, uh, you know, that we've become kind of a family within a family. You know, this is the 14th straight year that Warren Ruggiero, John Hunter, and I have worked together. I worked for Kevin Higgins back in 1994 and 95. Uh, Dave Cohen and I GA together and lived in the same house with five other coaches in 1989. And so we know each other and uh, we philosophically are aligned. Uh, those guys are really, really talented football coaches with great work ethics uh, who treat student athletes the right way. And uh, I'm just so lucky that we've been able to hire such a great staff here and that they've chosen to stay because all of those guys individually have had opportunities to leave as well. And I'm grateful to Ron Wellman and John Curry and President Wente and President Hatch that we have made their jobs better. Uh, so we've been able to retain them. And I'm just so excited about the new additions on defense with bringing Brad Lambert back and James Adams and Glenn Spencer, who worked with those guys at Charlotte has been a, a great addition as well. So uh, I, I feel that, you know, we're, we're very strong as a staff right now. And we have guys that, again, are aligned value system wise with Wake Forest. Coach, was the quarantine and the, the whole COVID sit, uh, situation, was that the toughest period that you sort of been through as a coach, having to navigate that, not just with your staff, but with the team and the entire country, deal, well, the world really dealing with it? Was that the toughest thing you've dealt with as a coach? It, it was challenging, but I, I think you go through those times and you, you find out a little bit more about your football team. Uh, so yeah, it was very challenging, uh, yeah. but the leadership that emerged from the 20 team in COVID allowed us to have 21. And wow. at the end of the day, there were some players that couldn't handle 20, it broke them. And a lot mm -hmm. of those players went into the portal and weren't with us in 21. But I really believe the players who stayed and the leadership that emerged from the challenges of the 20 season created the momentum for us to have 21. I mean, I just can't say enough about Luke Masterson and Jasir Taylor and Miles Fox and uh, Sam Hartman and Brandon Chapman and Michael Jurgens and other guys like Travion Red uh, and Suleiman Kamara and Zach Tom, who just played their very, very best football. 
and really brought the team together. And I just felt going into 21, we were as unified and as close as a football team as we had ever been during our time here. And that's kind of why we came up with the good to great yeah. is that I thought our football team could handle that challenge. Um, and that we were as unified on our team goals as much as we'd ever been, as much as I had ever seen in my football career. Coach, was the 21 season something that you look back on as that program elevating season, that season that just takes you to another level? Or would you say it was more of a, a build up and 21 was just sort of the, the result, as you mentioned, what, you know, what the team program went through in, in 20. So how would you sort of, uh, what category would you put 20, the 21 season in? Well, it, it was a very special season and you can look at it two ways. You know, you look at the individual season of how many special moments happened. Uh, you know, all the close wins we had, you know, beating Louisville with a last second field goal by Nick Skiba or Sam Hartman to a Torian Perry in overtime to beat Syracuse and the incredible win over NC State in front of a packed house and 90% of our students. And, you know, do those close wins and those moments happen without the closeness and the leadership we had? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. And then in a big picture, you hope a season like that elevates our whole program and what our expectations are. You know, I don't know if we're going to win 10 or 11 games every year. I think that's really hard. But our players now know that if we do things right, if we train hard, if we prepare well, Wake Forest football can be a program uh, that gets into the national conversation. And, you know, that always been our goal is to just get incrementally better every year. Yeah. And the end result of getting incrementally better is hopefully a team that can compete for championships, the college football playoffs, New York six bowls. And, you know, we are, are viewed as not just a good program in the state of North Carolina and the ACC, but nationally. Coach, if I want predictions on Wake's season, I'm talking to Sam Hartman because he put that out last year. So I want to see what he says uh, this year with the, the number of games that he's predicting. Uh, coach, uh, let's just say my, my son is eight years old. So let's fast forward nine, 10 years. And I'm thinking about sending him to Wake Forest. And you're still there as coach. What should I expect that you're going to teach and share with my son when he's under your care as head coach at Wake Forest? What can I expect as a parent? Well, that we, we are always going to make decisions um, for the betterment of your son's life and not just the short term, but the long term. And again, I think Wake Forest University does that. But, you know, we are a value based program. Uh, we're always going to make decisions that are best for the team first and the individual second. Uh, but the work ethic, the accountability, uh, the teamwork, uh, that they'll learn to develop here uh, in our program combined with what they learn academically on campus is going to put your son in a great position to go through the rest of his life. And again, we want to win football games and we want to win championships. But if we're not adding value to his life in other ways, then we're really failing your son. And we take great pride that we're going to add value to them academically, uh, to them as men, uh, in terms of developing their leadership, uh, their professional skills, their ability to interview and network. Uh, it's a comprehensive program here that we're, we're certainly going to bring them back to you in better shape than you dropped them off with us. Coach, uh, facts over that scholarship, I'll go ahead and sign for him. And uh, we'll go ahead and get that commitment off your board and taken care of. Uh, speaking of commitments, uh, you recently, you and your family recently committed to and created the Dave and Catherine Clawson Scholarship. Kind of talk about that and share with Deacon Nation why that was important to you and your family and how that sort of came about. Well, when the season was over, I sat down with Dr. Wente and I just, I thanked her. Uh, I thanked her for her support of our football team, of our football program, 
you know, by making decisions, whether it be to begin the uh, McCreary football complex uh, to support my contract extension that allowed us to keep staff. And I just wanted to tell her how grateful I was for her support and that I wanted to support her. And I asked her what her biggest priorities were for the university and that Catherine and I wanted to partner with her and be a good teammate with her vision for Wake Forest University. And she shared with us that uh, undergraduate need-based scholarships uh, to allow people to have access to this life-changing Wake Forest education was her top priority. And we uh, told her that we'd like to support her priorities uh, and, and give a scholarship that would be need-based, uh, that would allow somebody who is certainly academically qualified to attend Wake Forest, but maybe lack the means financially that we'd like to give them that opportunity. And it was also important to us that we wanted it to have an impact on the community. So our scholarship um, ideally will go to somebody who is from Winston-Salem uh, or for, in our Forsyth County. Uh, so again, it was uh, to support a place and a school and an institution and a president that we believe in, and, and also to support a community that's become our home. That's awesome, Coach. Um, and, and thank you to you, you and your family for, uh, for, for being willing to uh, pull that together. Uh, I want to jump on two things that, uh, you know, everybody's been talking about for at least the past two to three years. And so I want to talk about, I want to get your perspective on how Wake Forest is kind of dealing with and incorporating use of the transfer portal and the NIL. So starting with the transfer port, has your perspective changed or kind of stayed the same from when you first started hearing about it versus now that it's been in play and you know, we've kind of used, you've cut, you've used it a few times here and there. So what is, you know, kind of talk about the transfer portal. Well, <clears throat> you know, we're still a program that one would, that would prefer to grow our own. Uh, we still focus on recruiting uh, the right people to Wake Forest out of high school, uh, retaining them, keeping them here, keeping, making sure they're eligible and on track to graduate and then developing them, make sure they get stronger, faster, and become better football players. However, you go through a season or seasons, and sometimes a, a specific need may develop that maybe a player didn't develop, or maybe there was an injury, or maybe a player decided that they wanted to go somewhere else and go into the portal. And so we've always approached the portal that if we had a specific need, uh, that we felt would make our football team better that next season. If the answer was not within our program, then we would utilize the portal. And certain guys like Miles Fox uh, were great, great additions to our program. You know, Luigi Villan last year really helped us. Um, Donald Stewart had a great second year here as a grad transfer receiver. Uh, and there's a number of other guys that have helped us. And again, we believe in our players. And if we feel the player is already here, uh, you know, we're not going to go in the portal. But if we feel we're short somewhere or thin somewhere, and again, it's the same standard. Can the guy help us when, you know, is he committed to graduating and is he high character? You know, sometimes we'll take players in the portal to make sure we're not thin in a certain area going into a season. Ooh. And with the name, image, and likeness, for those in Beacon Nation that might not be aware of uh, what NIL means, not necessarily national recruiting of other institutions, but speaking Wake Forest specifically, has NIL impacted our your recruiting strategy, uh, impacted whether a recruit has come to Wake or not within the past year or so that you can kind of speak of? I know there may be some areas you can't specifically say, but can you kind of share with Deacon Nation how NIL is impacting recruiting or even if it is for Wake Forest as is? I mean, it's, it's going to impact recruiting. Uh, it's still, we're in the beginning of it. We're certainly not as far along with it as some other institutions. Um, you know, we want to make sure 
uh, that we have it set up. So if a player comes here and has success and creates a market value, uh, you know, we want that player to be able to capitalize on that value. So, uh, you know, there's certainly systems that the university has set up in the athletic department that would allow for a player who's had success that has marketability and has earned his right and the ability to market himself for his own personal gain. We, we certainly want to encourage that, yeah. but we met with our team today on name image likeness. And, you know, the best way to create that market value is to be a really good player on a really good football team. So we still want to keep the main thing, the main thing. And if focusing on getting a degree and becoming a better football player, you create market value for yourself. We want to help them capitalize on that and, and maximize it. And, and I think that's more than fair. Coach, this question uh, came in from a fan. Uh, you have uh, this great season, special season. Uh, didn't have the result we wanted for the ACC championship game, but you go into preparing for the Gator Bowl and you get the call uh, about Texas A&M not being able to, t to participate. Kind of go through what the, the next 24 to 48 hours were for you uh, as you're trying to figure out what is next for this bowl game. Well, we were very disappointed. Uh, we were certainly looking forward to playing Texas A&M again. And, uh, you know, that's certainly a brand name program. And we had already prepared the game plans for them. So as coaches, we probably had invested, I don't know how many hours and had the whole game plan put together. And, and part of the reason you do that during bowl season is, you know, so when you're practicing over Christmas and New Year's that you can give the staff some time off and enjoy their families. And so I think at that point, it was just really important that I be a transparent leader, that I, I talk to our team about what's going on, uh, you know, do you guys still want to play in the game? Uh, this could be the other bowl options. What do you guys want? The bowl is a reward for a season. Uh, I don't want to be dragging you somewhere. You don't want to go at a time that you don't want to go there. So you tell me what you want. You know, do you want to play? What's the timetable? And I want to make sure that we're doing this together. And the players felt very strongly uh, that they wanted to play in Jacksonville at the Gator Bowl to get that bowl game was a very big deal for them. That's a tier one bowl, great location. You're staying on the beach. And they just didn't want to stay here through Christmas if there wasn't the certainty of a game. So we kind of came up with a time frame that we wanted to play in the Gator Bowl, but we had to know at a certain time when the game was. And I really give Rutgers a lot of credit and Greg Schiano. I think a lot of teams who could have played in that game didn't want to. Uh, they accepted the challenge. And then it became a very busy week for our staff because we had to start game planning all over. Uh, so, you know, Christmas Day was a 14, 15 hour workday for us. And uh, we wanted to do the very best job we could to prepare our team and give them the best chance to win against Rutgers in the Gator Bowl. So that week was just a blur, uh, not a lot of sleep. You didn't really get to enjoy a lot of the bowl activities uh, because we were still game planning, uh, but it was certainly a rewarding day to go down there and get our 11th win and, and finish the season on a high note. So it was uh, one of the most tiring weeks of my entire football career, but also one of the most rewarding. Yeah, the end result uh, of the game, it just show the work that you guys have put into it. And I, you know, being there and spending that time with some football alums, there was just a, a great sense of pride in the job that you and your staff are doing and the job that the, the guys are doing and just taking the program to the next level. And I also want to say thank you and just your support of just football alums and welcoming, welcoming them back and being a part of this success. Why is that important to you? Because that's not something that is uh, supported at every institution. Yeah, I really believe the program belongs to the former players. Uh, there's gonna be this, this time in life that uh, myself and our staff have been entrusted as the caretaker of the program. 
Uh, but I think it's really important that you involve former players and the players that helped elevate it to this level. And it goes back generations and generations. It goes back to people who played, you know, for P. Head Walker and Paul Amen and Coach Dooley and uh, Coach Makovic and Coach Caldwell and Coach Grobe. Um, you know, they're all part of a brotherhood, which is Wake Forest football. And I, I just think when you're a former player uh, and, and you bled and sweat and went through all the practices in the weight rooms to represent Wake Forest and the football team, we always want those guys to feel that this is their program. And sometimes what happens with coaching changes is when coaches leave, the players no longer feel connected to the program because their coach isn't there. And it really, it takes time to build those relationships. And you've been so helpful and Coach Faircloth has been so helpful. And now that we have Wendell done, we have so many people from different generations of Wake Forest football that work closely with our program. And so I really wanna thank you and Wendell and Coach Fair and all those people who outreach to former players and make them feel comfortable coming back. And I think once they spend time uh, with our coaching staff and our players, uh, they now feel more connected to our program. So in my mind, we can't do enough of that stuff. And the career night we had last Friday before the spring game, that is one of my favorite nights of the year, is seeing our current team interacting with whatever, 10, 20, 40, 50 former players that played football at Wake Forest, wore the black and gold, and loved this institution. And they're able to share their experiences as a Wake Forest student athlete and in their professional life that helps benefit our current players. Coach, that is a huge uh, event that uh, you've just uh, that you've put forth and really have supported, and it has had a major impact. Uh, the the career night is where former players get a chance to not just you know share their knowledge of uh, the experience of Wake, but their professional development and be be there to help mentor and and guide them and in a sense welcome them in a way into this uh, you know the coming brotherhood of being a Wake Forest football alumni. Uh, where did that come from? the the idea of focusing on the career at the same time they're parallel getting better as a player and continuing to do well in the classroom what made you decide to add that professional development piece you know it's something kevin that i've done anywhere everywhere i've started that at fordham and you know you always talk to players in recruitment about how you're going to help develop them and get them ready for life after football and I just felt if we were saying that in recruiting, we better make sure we're really doing that. And you know, providing that exposure and, and getting dressed up in a suit and a tie and learning to interact in a professional way and to carry a conversation and to gain knowledge on potential professions you wanna get into, you know, clearly you can make the NFL from Wake Forest. Uh, the number of players we've put into the NFL the last five years speaks for itself. What we value here is your life after football can be just as rewarding with a Wake Forest degree. And when your teammates and classmates and those people come back and they were successful as football players and then professionally successful in their life after football, that's more powerful than anything I can tell our team when they meet these players and view how they conduct themselves and how they speak and how well they've done in the business world or whatever career they've decided to pursue. That's awesome. Coach, uh, you have been a part of coaching and creating some wonderful Wake Forest Deacon moments uh, on the field, just some of the biggest games, designing, calling some great plays. What is your favorite Deacon moment on the field and off the field? Oh, uh, you know, th there's been a lot of, of, of great moments on the field. Uh, you know, certainly the, you know, the Belk Bowl win against yeah. Texas A&M in 17 was a special moment. Yeah. You know, taking the field down in Charlotte for the ACC championship game and just seeing that sea of black and gold and all the students. Uh, you know, that was a goose, 
a goosebump moment that, and I told the team, like you created this, uh, that your hard work has unified an institution, a fan base, an alumni group. Um, and, and certainly those moments. Um, but I think what's as rewarding as anything is when former players come back. You know, we have our pro day and Boogie Basham and Kendall Hinton and Asang Bassey come back just to support their teammates. And those type of moments tell me that those relationships and those friendships that you hope your players build are happening. You know, I went to Cam Serenay's wedding and the amount of Wake Forest football players are there. And now Cam started a business and, you know, he hired Devin Pike and he hired uh, Jack Frudenthal. And he, these are guys that he played football with at the same position, was in the same meeting room. And now they're all working together. And when they're here, they're in that room, not necessarily by choice. They didn't choose to be with each other. But when they leave Wake Forest and graduate and they choose to spend all this time together, uh, after they've been here, that is really rewarding and meaningful to me that we have helped create lifetime bonds. That's awesome. Coach, before you get out of here, you have to give me a, a, a snapshot or, or what are your thoughts for the upcoming season? Who should we look out for? What players may, you know, jump out at us? Uh, what, just kind of give us uh, an update for the upcoming season. Well, what's so fun about working at Wake Forest is every year some guy emerges that nobody knew about the year before. Yep. If we had done this interview a year ago and I told you that A.T. Perry can be an all ACC receiver, you know, you have Ja'Cory Roberson yep. back, you have Donovan Green. Uh, so what's so rewarding here is just watching players develop, seeing guys who didn't even play a year ago that are starting to develop as football players as men and you're just watching them mature right before your very eyes. And, you know, a player that I'm really proud about is Chase Jones. You know, Chase Jones just got elected captain as an underclassman. So we have all these starters and all these older guys back. And he's a guy that has just grown, matured, became a captain. He's going to start for us and has a chance to, I think, really have a big time season for us. Um, and even, you know, some of the, the defensive tackles, watching Deion Bergen and Tyler Williams and now Kobe Bryant and Kevin Pointer. You, know, you lose Miles Fox and you lose Suleiman Kamara. And then you have these younger guys that are stepping up and older guys playing better football than they've ever played. Uh, so the rewards here are, are, are not so much the guys coming back that we know are good football players and good leaders, but watching these younger guys develop and, and become the players that we saw and we thought they could become when we recruited them. That's awesome, Coach. Uh, Coach, Deacon Nation uh, may not know this about you, and I just learned this recently about you, that you're a foodie. Is that correct? Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fake foodie. I think I'm a foodie, <laughs> but I'm not really a foodie. So I, I enjoy eating out. My wife and my family and I like picking restaurants and different types of food. and. Uh, you know, every now and then I'll, I'll try my hand at making something with mixed results. Uh, but that is certainly something that we enjoy as a family is food. What's your favorite place, coach? Outside of Winston, so we don't get in trouble. Outside of Winston, favorite oh, place? Oh, that, that is, um, there are so many, and I'm going to insult somebody. Uh, <laughs> so there, there's a place, uh, I think it's in, uh, in, in Asheville okay. called Rhubarb. Okay. And the chef there is a guy named John Flair, I believe his name is. And his, his dad, I think, was a professor at, uh, at Wake Forest. And he grew up on Faculty Drive. And now he has a restaurant uh, that I believe is in, in Asheville uh, called Rhubarb. And anytime I'm passing through there, I always try to stop and eat. It's outstanding. That's a, that's awesome, Coach. Uh, I think we'll be I think we'll be good with that. As long as you didn't say it was in Chapel Hill, I was hoping you weren't going to pick a you you were not going to pick a restaurant in Chapel Hill. Zero chance. <laughs> well, drive we drive right through that pat place before we stop anywhere. Hey, Coach, I know you've got to run again. Thank you so much for taking the time out to be uh, part of the Deek to Deek podcast and uh, to share more about yourself with uh, Deacon Nation. 
any any other comments you want to you want to add or share with Deacon Nation before you have to run? Just the the support that our football team got last year. Uh, Deacon Nation was a difference maker for us, especially in that NC State and those Duke games. Yeah. Um, and if we would like it to be that uh, Truist Field is packed for every single home game, uh, the energy, the juice. Uh, the environment that you helped create for our football team and give us a home field advantage. You know, it wasn't an accident last year. We were undefeated at home. Deacon Nation had so much to do with that. So we just hope we can, can count on your support, beginning with the opener against VMI. And, and let's make Truist Field one of the best environments in the ACC.